Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Guild Hall, the home to the oldest continuous civil democracy, civic democracy, overseeing governance and services for London and the nation for over 600 years. The very document on which that democracy is based is housed in these soaring walls. The City of London's 13th century Magna Carta is on display downstairs in our Heritage Gallery. So do take a look if you haven't already. 800 years ago, the Lord Mayor of London and 24 merchant barons held the King of England to account. Actions which led to the rule of law and justice for all. We are the inheritors of that legacy. What will our own look like? As an international Lord Mayor who was born in Malaysia, educated in Singapore, and worked across the world for 40 years in capital markets and investment banking. I believe passionately that successful and innovative financial markets means jobs and growth across the world. And I know that the flow of talent is as important as the flow of trade. This is what the City of London has always stood for, and it's why people from nearly 300 countries call this home, including our esteemed Canadian Governor, the Bank of, the Governor of the Bank of England. Governor Carney spoke at Mansion House today, and I was also glad to stand with him earlier this month at the annual Bankers and Merchants Dinner. He said then, the city has a special responsibility given London's preeminent position in global markets, which is why it has already brought so many ideas and such energy to advance financial reform. I heartily agree. And it's this unique position as a global leader, innovator, and crucible for debate that underpins today's event. The people within this room and in this place have the power to effect real change. In recent times, the city brand, the beating heart of our economy, whose arteries pump prosperity throughout the world, has taken a real hammering. The hammering has been indiscriminate. The collateral damage has been great. Public perception, fueled by a baying press, is not good. We cannot and should not stand idly by. And as Lord Mayor, I speak to and for the city. And as I've said many times, I condemn anyone who willfully puts himself first and his client second. Indulging individual greed at the expense of society and shareholders without they themselves taking the risk. But bad apples are being removed from the barrel, and the system that allowed them to rot in place is being overhauled. The Fair and Effective Markets Review, FEMA, marks a new stage of that journey. Everybody wants clean and efficient markets, but that takes positive engagement of management. Let's get real. Responsible behavior is not the sole responsibility of the regulator. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's always right. Regulators will always be behind the curve of innovation, and that is not a criticism. That is reality. It's for management to ensure that not just the principle, but also the spirit of regulation is enforced by their people. It's like a supermarket with no security cameras. If someone takes something without paying, it's theft. Theft is theft. People should uphold professional standards, irrespective of whether the regulators are there or not. And it's up to management to set that tone and enforce that discipline. Because responsible business is in all our interests. And it's brilliant to see the Bank of England show such leadership in setting the bar higher. Stipulating from now on all their senior management will be expected to meet the highest standards of professional conduct, just as high as they are applying to the practitioners. That is a fantastic step forward, and one which I hope will see adopted across the world. I know that the bank consulted widely, widely during the development of FEMA recommendations, and I strongly encourage all individual national regulators to act in the same bold way. This is very tricky, sorry. 
Now, at this event last year, my predecessor, Dame Fiona Wolf, asked, who will change traditional thinking if our teams are full of people just like us? Good question. Earlier this month, UK papers ran the story that people from posh backgrounds, affluent backgrounds, are more likely to get jobs in top firms. According to a recent study, even the type of accent can put off employers. This is fundamentally dangerous. When I was head of Climate Benson, I wanted the best and the brightest, regardless of origin, background, or gender. In fact, the more diversity in the team, the better. And this fosters a greater breadth of thought, increased innovation, and extra resilience. We need to get better at being more inclusive. In terms of gender, in terms of socioeconomic backgrounds, and in terms of abilities. My eldest son is disabled. My wife and I know firsthand the impact of disabilities on individuals and their families. The challenges of being perceived on the fringes of society without the same access to the opportunities as everyone else. Did you know that here in the UK, a child is diagnosed as disabled every 10 minutes? Did you know that parents of disabled children are three times more likely to suffer mental illness? This is a mainstream matter, and it's for us as employers to support employees, and it's for us to understand their additional needs and support those living with the reality. And disability is part of the diversity agenda. And with a fresh approach, we can better harness and deploy wider ranges of abilities and skills. I recently heard of a company which actively recruits people on the autistic spectrum, seeking above average degrees of focus and attention to detail, qualities which are an asset to any organization. I repeat, we are all part of society and we want to include and support every part of it. And that's why my mayoral theme is creating wealth, giving time, supporting people, creating and investing in rich pools of capital, both human and financial. A wealth of time and resource, talent and opportunity. As we all know, wealth creation is a good thing. You can't use it if you don't create it, and use responsibly, it can do a lot of good in particular, helping those who are less able to help themselves. With that in mind, after the excitement of the second Inclusive Capital, Capitalism Conference, we have our second City Giving Day on the 30th of September, celebrating the terrific contribution made by city businesses and their employees to our communities. Time given, people supported. And the city houses an army of volunteers, and volunteering is making a huge economic social contribution. In 1968, Senator Robert Kennedy said, GDP measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. This event explores how wealth creators can transform lives and livelihoods for the long term, promote peace and prosperity through responsible business and good governance. Thank you very much.